Uh, hi, Gary. So, big one today. They're always big ones, aren't they? I mean, They're always big ones. I know, but I like to say that. I like the, to give it a sense of occasion. Are we, are we saying that some of our interviewees have not been big? I think they've all been big. Well, you're absolutely right. Now I feel terrible because you're making it look like I'm singling out people well, to be not as big. Yes. <laughs> um, but Noel is big. It was Oasis were massive. I mean, let's face it. I mean, one of the most massive bands ever. Do you know what's the story? Outsold Dark Side of the Moon in the UK. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I went to see... Oh, I don't know if this will come up because I actually went to see... He did a thing when they played Earl's Court the first time. said, I can't believe Pink Floyd were here a year ago and we're here now. And I actually went to see him at Earl's Court with David Gilmore. And then I went to see them in Main Road, which was actually the first place I ever played in the UK with Pink Floyd. But you know, what's, what's the story? Was their difficult second album, right? It was. It was great. It was <laughs> yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, to make it so quick and so soon. Do you know what? I think there was a moment, wasn't there, where culture and and band became one i mean they represented a certain type of culture in the 90s uh, yeah well it, it was it was i mean and it was that you know let's be honest it was the time of loaded and the new lad i guess yeah but you know, none greater football. than none greater than liam and noel though absolutely no absolutely yeah absolutely but i mean i'm listen can you ask the questions about liam because i don't want to get in trouble um, no, I'm, I'm going to mention it and then I'm going to mention that you get on with your brother really well and then see how we go. <laughs> so let's get him on. All right. Welcome to the Rock and Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. This was great, guys. I, I, it's so great to talk to two guys that have done this. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. You know, what people forget about Bowie is that he was such a kind man. Remember me? I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good at something. Yeah. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. How are you lot? Is, you all right? Yeah, good. Thanks, No. Yeah, it looks nice where you are. you still got your Christmas cards up. Is that what it, what's going on behind yeah. you? Uh, they are uh, the little things from an artist called The Postman. Uh, the little uh, uh, he does oh, like, yeah, that the person who posts all over Brighton. That's right. Yes. Uh, that's right. Yeah, he he's posts uh, all around where I am. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Uh, there's one of me on a on a on a electricity box somewhere. So I got in touch with him, and they're going to do some artwork for me soon. Some t-shirts. Oh, that's right. He, they're brilliant. Yeah, they're he, fantastic. He, yeah, he did one of Steve Norman in my old band. You know, did he really? Right. Yeah, well, that, I, 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 it's up on the some wall. That's Johnny. Johnny wrote on a nuts. Ian Brown, if you can see him, but um, yeah, they're, can, yeah, they're yeah. great, yeah, amazing. A lot stuff. of Nick Cave, a lot of Nick Cave. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's local lads, you know. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. They're amazing. Um, so anyway, where are you? I'm in London. I think you're in London, guy, aren't you? I'm in, I'm in London. All right, I'm we're in, all in yeah. London. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're all in, we could have come. We should have come to your studio. I know you've got a good studio because I just saw a bit of uh, Paul. Well, this is doing oh, well, okay. Paul Weller. Right, okay, yeah. This is well, this is it. It's uh, uh it's in King's Cross. Yeah, I've had it since November. It's uh. It's been a bit of a haven while life has been a bit shit as, uh, you know, as yeah. musicians. Well, it's nice we, that you can actually have the illusion of kind of going out to work. Well, than doing it at home. yeah, I mean, my missus thinks I'm making a double album when really I've been sitting here listening, <laughs> listening to talk sport, eating crisps for about two months. <laughs> so do you, have a, do you have a regular routine? Do you go, try and go in sort of five days a week or what is it? Well, it's been a bit stop start. Uh, I only finished it in November, but up until about a month, uh, up until I started doing the promo, I do go in most days, yeah. I, I, the, the routine I've got is from like 12 till 6. I don't really work hours after that. I lose interest after that. But um, I guess when you've got your own studio, you're duty bound to be in it every day. You know, yeah. I, mean, what, I mean, what else are you going to do? Yeah. yeah. How was the lockdown period? Was it creative for you? Did it sort of well, inspire you? For everybody that I know who's a musician and a writer, it has been, yeah. I don't know anybody that's had a, a particularly bad lockdown i guess because we've had so much time on our hands um for me i just started yeah. to finish off all the half written songs that i that, that i that i had and uh, i got about half an album's worth out of that so professionally it's been great but privately it's been awful i've hated every fucking day of it it's been uh, terrible what it's done to the kids and all that and um yeah. but yeah but i found it creative yeah for sure yeah, and no, I mean, I had a similar thing. I, I ended up f finishing an album and uh, and then, you know, Guy and I started a podcast. I mean, I, we were both meant to be on the road last year. Yeah. And then when that stopped, it was like, well, let, let's just make, make music. And there were other artists that were around, so you could sort of work remotely. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. other players. Have well, you been doing that? I did it. I don't really go in for the co-writing thing, and I never have. I mean, I've done it 
off and on down the years. But in, in lockdown, I co-wrote five tunes with different people, which I would never have done because I would never have had the time. I would have been on the road somewhere or I would have been recovering from being on the road. So, uh, and a few good things came out of it. Um, Can you say who it was? Uh, yeah, I did a track with Dizzy Rascal that actually, ironically never hasn't appeared yet. I did a track with Imelda May. Uh, I did one... Oh, she's great. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. We had her on. Yeah. I did uh, a track with that uh, dance band from Liverpool, Camel Fat. And uh, we attempted to write a tune with Weller, but I don't think we ever finished it. Uh, so, yeah, I did a bit of that. And then he's just like, you know, the phone call you usually get, oh, are you around kind of thing. And you're usually like, oh, no, I'm not around. Before they even asked us around, I said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. I'm, I'm jumping the cab now. <laughs> so it was, it was great just to be, you know, just to be doing something. Do you know what I mean? I know what you're saying about co-writing because I've never co-written. Re- yes, I you mean, have. I, well, with you, yeah. Well, okay, yeah. you're not, not <laughs> that in was the, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. We've written but, a musical. But I, I don't like co-writing because I'm, when I, the first thing I did when I was a kid, when I first got my guitar at 11, I remember it was the play in the day, Burt Weed, and you, I, some, there were four chords I, if I had a hammer. And I thought, well, I don't want to sing if I had a hammer. That doesn't belong to me. And I'll make up my own tune to go with those chords. And I felt like I'd owned something. And, and it's about, it felt like it was about me. And, and as, a, as a songwriter, it's, it's kind of about making something that is personal to you and that you own. I mean, is that how you feel? Yeah, well, I think uh, to write a song on your own, it, it's a real, not that my songs are personal, but I think to be that thing where you co-write with people, it's a special gift and it takes a special kind of mindset that I don't have. You know, I write so quickly as a songwriter, I couldn't I couldn't come up with an idea and then wait two weeks for someone to finish it off because I, I, I could do it immediately myself. Yeah. But I, I struggle with the co-writing thing and I've tried it and it's not something I'm comfortable with. But funnily enough, when I do do it, I kind of enjoy it a little bit, you know what I mean? But it's just, it's just not, it's something that doesn't come naturally to me. Because it, it, it seems like, for some reason, just because of the way your, your lyrics are, it seems like your words seem to fall out of you very easily. You find that? Uh, they're, the, they're usually the last, they, they yeah. are the last thing that appears in a song. It's always the melody and the arrangement first, and the words are last. And um, as long as I can get a good first line of a verse, I'm all right. I, that's the jumping off point, but it takes me forever to get a good first line, and particularly one that I've never used before, or particularly one yeah. that's not someone else's first line. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I find that if I've written a melody and then I, I can't find that first line or I can't find the chorus and it sits around for a while, it gets harder and harder to find lyrics for it. It's just, it's sort of my, my impetus vanishes. Uh, but so I, eventually you just say, why do I find it hard to write the next line? Well, hey, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. there you go, there you go. Um, well, I'm, 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 I've always got about ten or fifteen songs, like in a state of, you know, a couple of lines in the verse, a definite melody, a couple of lines in the chorus, and then I, I leave it at that, and I go back to it, keep going back to it, chipping away at it. But the ones, as you well know, the ones that fall out of the sky all in one go. You know, you know they're going yeah. to be, you know they're going to be the ones because they're coming Always. from somewhere else. Those are the songs that find you. You don't write it; it comes to you. Um, and yeah, it's like when McCartney wrote yesterday. And he woke up in the morning and he had it all in his, it written, and he couldn't yeah, believe scrap, it. He thought, yeah. I must have just yeah. nicked it. You yeah, know? yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, when that happens. I'm sure, it's happened for the pair of you. It's kind of like it's the airs on the, the, your arms stand up because you're just like wow, you know, and. Um, I've had that a few times down the years, and and they end up being the real special, special songs. Yeah, uh, for me, well, through, was, the bar- through the barricades was how that came about, like that for me. You know, right. I, mean, I know you, 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 you wrote some of your biggest hits. Yeah, like, well, super fast. yeah. The, I mean, the first, the first, the first time it ever happened to me was when I wrote "Live Forever," and I wrote it all in one go, and I actually couldn't, I actually couldn't believe it. And um, but that's not to say that the ones that take you a while don't connect. It's just. It's just that the ones that fall out of the sky fully formed are coming from somewhere else, you know. And if you didn't catch it, someone else is going to catch it, you know. And you well, there's, <laughs> there's that Keith Richards quote, isn't it? When he was, it was some very serious European interviewer years and years ago, and he, Keith was out of it. They said, um, So, Keith, how did you write these amazing songs, these incredible riffs? And he went, Well, I don't really, I just happened to be awake at the time. <laughs> and there's kind of there's a truth to that, probably. yeah. Well, I liken it, I liken it to going fishing. You know, you sit, you know, fishermen, 
they kind of sit there. Do you go fishy? No, I don't. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, but it's kind of like, you know, they sit there all day and it's not really about catching the fit. The, you might only catch once in a while. It's about, it's almost like meditation for me. You're just kind of writing, but not writing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden something happens and you'll be playing a chord sequence that means nothing for three or four months. And then all of a sudden, one day you get up and play the same thing and the fireworks start going off. And why that is, is just magic to me. I don't, I've never worked out why that, why that happens the way it does. Yeah. Are you much of a reader, Noel? I don't read fiction. I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm... No, but, I don't, but like, for, um, I've wondered who built the moon. Is that, that, well, I, funnily enough, that's from... Uh, is that from the book? Well, it's, it's a chapter in a book. Uh, when I was younger, obviously, and heavily into drugs, I was into conspiracy theories, right, and all that kind of thing. I remember seeing a picture of you in a hotel room once with a, with a UFO. Book yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, endless nights fucking out of your mind just going, yeah. there's pyramids on the moon. <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and there's a chapter in some book that I, I'd read down the years where uh, somebody had purported the myth that uh, the moon was actually a space station. And I remember thinking, this guy's just watched Star Wars. He just thinks it's the Death Star. <laughs> you know, but, it, but the chapter was called Who Built the Moon? So. No, but there is actually a whole book, which, funny, which Alex Patterson of oh, the really? Oh, really? All right, okay. Me. Yeah, right. it's a whole... <laughs> about that theory? <laughs> about that theory. Well, it's just about the fact that it's all too perfect, but how the moon fits the sun perfectly for an eclipse, <laughs> and it's exactly oh, like yeah. this size <laughs> for moon from the Earth. You know? Well, it, yeah. I mean, that, that shit kept me going through the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you know, but you know, um, Piper at the Gates of Dawn was a, was a chapter in a book as well, wasn't it? Wind in the Willows. Wind in the Willows, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you're not the first to, you know, that's... Oh, I'm no, sure. That's the, that's the difference. Like he said later on, we, 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 all, we all loves conspiracy stuff. All the psychedelic stuff was children's books. Was right, yeah, Lord, Lord, of the, Lord, Alice of the, in Wonderland. Lord of the Rings and all that thing, yeah. Lord of the, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I love the new song. Thank, Thank you, you very much. It sounds great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And, and uh, the video to go with it, sort of... Uh, uh, yeah, well, like new wave who are you, film. Who are you? Is it? Are you the boss of a firm? I or? Look, listen. I, <laughs> I, when Matt Smith, I, I was talking about. fucking yeah, yeah, no, but the, hate. You know, when Noel turns up in it. I hate videos. I hate them with a passion. Yeah. I hate the fact that they fucking cost money, and to fucking piss around all day in the rain, for some director saying right. So what I want is, so anyway, I I have a rule. Whereas I will be in one of my videos. Don't tell me what it is. I'll be in it for as little time as possible. I'm not sure what the story is behind that video. I just give my mates, I've got two mates, Scully and Dan, and I give say, this is all I can afford. And I give it to them and say, just go and do whatever you can. And uh, I'll be in it for 10 seconds. And if I can, I'll blag another famous person to be in it for me. So it's like with Matt Smith, I've known him for a long time. One night he was round at our house and as he was leaving at four in the morning, I was like, mate, has he been in a video, dude? And he's like, yeah, no problem. And uh, I kind of held him to it. But I'm not sure the second video is supposed to carry on from this one, so he's in the next one. So I'm, I think all will become apparent in the second video. And did you put the band together during the lockdown last? Yeah, we did. Um, yeah. We've just done a, a gig for Sky Arts in the Duke of York Theatre. And um, so, we, yeah, there's no, there's no crowd there, obviously. So uh, we uh, we had the theatre for a week and they filmed us rehearsing it all and getting back together and all that. And um, as you know yourself, but obviously not playing together for a, for about uh, 18 months, couple of years, you really do forget how good for the soul live music is. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and uh, we were here rehearsing for a few, and obviously the first few days were a bit ropey, had forgotten everything. But... I remember going home like you know like your spirits are elevated because you've been you know playing your tunes with and and it's not only the tunes it's the fact we hadn't seen each other for 18 months and we're all in different parts of the world there's people in france and people in liverpool and manchester and right. uh, and um <laughs> all getting together and it's really it's really good for the soul i can't wait for people to get back into uh venues to see it because it's going to elevate everybody's spirit and the one thing that was really fucking annoying during the lockdown is there seemed to be a roadmap for everything, football and fucking going to the park and all this. And you were just begging the government to say, what about music? It's yeah, fucking no. important. Well, that's the thing. We, we, ever since day one is that we were always going to be literally the last people on earth of course. to work. And you know why that the is? Last. And they, they're not going to look after us because they know we're going to fuck them at the next election. 
Yeah, you know and, and and I think also you know there was the arts were certainly you know against Brexit, and then so you know, yeah. they, they don't they feel like they owe us nothing. Well, but yeah, I did hear. Sorry. Go well, on. there was a great thing on that. There's a, the program on Sky Arts at the minute, the uh, the live revival program. I don't know whether you've seen it, and it's about all the the old little pub venues shutting down. And Weller made a great point. He was doing an interview in the Hundred Club, and he was saying that if the Hundred Club was a place where they had ballet or theatre, there'd be a preservation order on it. You wouldn't yeah. be allowed to touch yeah. it. But because it's only music, and we say only in inverted commas, because it's only music, it's like, fuck it, they'll turn it into flats, you know, and it's a disgrace. But then comedy was even lower. Did yeah. You know, when, the, when the first tranche of trying to, you know, venues but, got... But we are got. comedians... Com and comedy didn't count. Yeah, well, well, comedians and musicians are the dissenters, and they don't like yeah. us, you know, because we call them out. Well, I mean, there is a class thing as well, isn't it? I mean, you know, rock and roll is usually seen... It's a working class yeah. art form, isn't yeah. it? It's, it's folk music. It's it's pop. Yeah. And, it's, and, 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 it, and, it, and, it, and it promotes the gatherings of people, you know what I mean? And that's what is the thing that's that, that lockdown hit the most, is it stopped people gathering together, you know? Um, but I heard yesterday that out of all the tests they've been doing in the football stadiums and that club in Liverpool and the comedy show, you know, where no one was wearing masks and they all got tested beforehand, there was 58,000 people altogether and only 15 cases of COVID have come out yeah. of that. Right, well, so, you know, great. It's a good sign. Great, great, great. I can't, I, you know, I can't stress enough to anybody who's listening to this, is once you get in a room and you hear live music, your spirit is elevated. Yeah, uh, so guy and I. Went, guy and I. I went to two. Well, I did a week with it. I went to two gigs last Saturday, but really, really small. Um, one was Chrissy Hine doing her new Dylan album, but it was just fantastic to be in a room. Yeah, yeah, people, yeah, yeah. You know. Amazing. But guy and I got together and played loudly. I put a band together a few weeks ago, and uh, it was just one of the best few days we've had. I've had it in over a year, you know, we, just the loudness of it all yeah, and, the, it and the camaraderie, you know, that goes on between people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, 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 I mean, it's a, it's a. You know, it's a we're in a privileged not in the traditional sense, but we're in a privileged position that we are musicians and we do get together with other other people, like-minded people, and it is a it's a it's a brilliant. You, and you forget if you've not done it for yeah. over a year, you yeah. you forget how great it makes you feel. I mean, in a way, it, there's almost. I mean, I don't. I, this is probably reaching a bit, but there's almost kind of a thing to having it taken away for a little bit to make you value, you know. How much well, like, what, yeah, you know, like, like I used to. I heard about someone who wore a shoes a size smaller than he should, so just because he liked taking them off when he got home. You mean like that guy? <laughs> well, no, you could say that about any English leisure pursuit, which is like sailing or rambling or anything, or going to festivals. It's all about going and being cold and miserable, and then at the end of the day, going, "Oh, I got through that." Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, you obviously, you know, you you escaped your band all those years ago now, but you're. You've never been out just with you. It's, you know, you made the high flying birds. Is that something that you just couldn't bring yourself to be just Noel Gallagher, that you wanted a band of familiar faces around you and a little bit of that com gang comfort? Well, how that the high flying birds moniker came about was when I was making my first solo album, I was in uh, State of the Ark in Twickenham. I don't know whether you've been to that studio. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and on yeah, the way, on on the way stuff, back, yeah. I would drive through Shepherd's Bush. And I remember I would drive past Shepherd's Bush Empire every night and I would try and visualise my name above the door and I just didn't see it. I couldn't. And, I, and then as I went into it, I thought, if I go out as Noel Gallagher, people are going to be expecting a lot of the hits, right? And I didn't have enough new material to carry that through. And I was... a, And I... I don't know, it's just well, one afternoon I was just at home and I was listening to the radio and uh, Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac had been on previous to the, the song High Flying Bird by Judy Hensk. And, ah. and I just had a light bulb oh, yeah. moment. And I was like, no way, you know, Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac and all guys are High Flying Birds and that was it. And, um, but to answer the second part of that, I didn't, I never, re I was reminded by a journalist recently when I've been doing promo for this best of that, I'd done an interview with this guy on the day that I announced I was going solo and he asked me what I thought my thing, how it was going to be. And I said that I didn't want to set line up. I wanted my band to evolve as the music ev evolves. Because I've been in a band. Once you've been in a band for that amount of time with a very rigid structure and musical identity, it's like, mm. I don't want to do that anymore. You know what I mean? I've done it and smashed it and it was great and there was a full stop put against it. And my band has evolved. It started off as five grumpy middle-aged men 
um, uh, getting out of the house, and now there's like you know exotic French girls involved, and somebody playing the scissors for fuck's sake, you know. And it's uh, right, uh, it's, yeah. it's all it's all kind of going. It's still unfolding for me, and it's all moving along quite nicely. Yeah, but I was going to ask about yeah. that. If it, if you deliberately, if, if if Oasis was just Oasis, and then this is what you've evolved into, or if you deliberately gave yourself a broader palette with high flying birds, because it really sounds like that. I wanted to make the music that I listened to, and in Oasis, it was you know yourself when you when you're in a band that becomes so big, it becomes a brand, and people expect certain things from you, and you make music to tailor your surroundings. And we were playing stadium, so stadium rock was what it was, but I never really listened to stadium rock. I was more listening to electronic music and dance music and psychedelic mm. stuff and all that. And um, so I definitely wanted to get away from that, uh, but I didn't want to do it too quick either. So it took a while to uh, finally spread my wings, but... Um, you know, the great thing about being solo is you can just go at your own pace. You don't need to, you don't have to explain it to anybody else. If anybody doesn't get it, it doesn't matter because it's your thing. So I'm loving it. Absolutely loving it. And would you use different musicians on an album? Would you say, right, on this track, I need electronica well, or? Well, I have to say, my live band don't usually play on the records because uh, my live band is one thing and they're all over the world. So if I'm in London making a record, I, I'll just, the, the nearest person, you know what I mean? I'm not going to travel anybody down from uh from up north uh so i use i i i will literally use as many outside influences as possible because they just add something different once you play the same guitar all the time for the same amp you get the same sound out of it right no matter if the, the lyrics might be different and the arrangement might be different but it's still the same thing whereas i'll get everybody involved anyone anyone can have a crack at what i do as long as they bring something that's worthwhile but by the way, talking of which, you said that you were inspired by Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac by the name. I saw you at the Peter Green tribute, and it was the last that was gig. Great, it, man. it was the last yeah. gig anybody ever did. The last gig. Yeah. But um, um, God, what a lineup! We weren't expecting half those people. But um, uh, but well done, man. That was you know that's well, I d I did. It was a big stage to step on with all yeah, because I know what it's like. I've had a lifetime of playing with the old lags, and it's kind of well, I went. <laughs> I it was it was um, Zach Starkey called me and said, oh, would Mick's putting on this thing and. Remember when we used to do Fleetwood Mac covers in the sound checks when Zach was in Oasis? So I said, yeah, and anyway, Mick sent me an email and they were rehearsing in this place. I was so naive, I didn't know what was going on. I walk in and there's Aerosmith, Dave Gilmore, Billy Gibbons, <laughs> you know, Mick Fleetwood, Christine McVie, and I'm just like, oh, right. oh okay, oh, all right, this is serious now. And I was kind of like, fucking hell. You know, I'm the least just, bluesy person out of all these. It was a it was a pretty twelve bar evening. Yeah, you know, I kind of I've got quite a ceiling on that. I yeah, I you probably have too. Well, when I walked out on the stage and there was a kind of like of applause of people going, "What the fuck's he doing here?" And I was like, kind of, uh, I said, "I know what you're all thinking." Yeah, like, no, you he, played that up, which was like, brilliant. It, it was brave, you're you thinking, he covered ain't, yourself. He, well. he ain't got the fucking blues. <laughs> <laughs> and, what uh, song did you do? I did. Feels like crying. Uh, and I did World Keeps Turning and another one which I didn't know that they dropped on me on the night and uh, it was just some blues number number but it was, I, it was I'd never met all those people and kind of Glyn Glyn Johns was producing it and all that and it was amazing you know you were talking earlier about writing you know having stadium songs mm. you sort of did it mm. from day one didn't you yeah I mean, that is that was in your blood you were making massive anthemic songs sitting you know while you were still working on a construction site. yeah yeah i mean i get that you know those first two albums i swear to god they came from somewhere else they were uh, they were eff effortless to write um and uh i never really appreciated it until years and years after what yeah what we did and actually i was watching the there's a there's a oasis uh, uh a documentary of nebworth coming out in in October and I've been doing my interviews bits for that and watching some of the footage and it's actually I never really because you're so involved in a thing you perceive what you do completely differently to everybody else but actually now with the with the passage of time I was looking at Oasis at Nebworth playing live and we were fucking unbelievable it was fucking unbelievable I couldn't believe yeah. it I was like I still had to say is that me playing the guitar because ever since I've gone solo my kind of guitar has gone to the taking a back seat now and I've, someone else plays all the, the fiddly bits and I was looking at Nebworth going fucking that was really good <laughs> that's really fucking good but is that do you think that's that's absolutely Oasis in its pomp oh ah, yeah it was that. Uh, and do you know what it is it's because Liam was at his, his zenith 
as a front man. And when your singer's at his peak, your band is at its peak. And it was, and, it, and I, I, I realise that now. And uh, yeah, it was a moment in time we were at, you know, and you might as well be peaking when you're playing to a quarter of a million people. That's when you want to peak. Yeah. But you know, I'm, I mean, I've, I've watched bits of that and it, it is extraordinary. And what I, what it feels like to me is that it's, it's not just Liam at his zenith, you know, it's a cultural moment yeah. at its peak that there is, that, that, that the audience at that point aren't just there to see you and sing your praises. They're there to sing their own praises, that they are a part of something you're representing on a stage them yeah. as greater human beings of course but, but that's what they that was the charge that filled that space i think and what really is a sh uh is significant in it all that is 1000 percent true but if that happened now everybody would be filming it there's not a single yeah. Yeah. fucking phone in the field it's the fans and the band in the moment with the music yeah all there present it's an amazing document of uh, the pre-internet the pre-internet age yeah. you know it's the last well, you say you, you say yourself this is history you yeah. say to them don't you when yeah you're on stage. I, I felt it at, well i felt it at the time and uh i remember coming off stage and one of the promoters you know as these big gigs oh we can do five nights next year and we were like yeah whatever and he said you know because we can sell the tickets on the internet and i was like the internet what the fuck's that <laughs> And he, and he explained to me what the internet was and I started laughing and went, that'll never catch on. What? Mobile phones? Who wants to be contactable 24 hours a day? Fuck that. Mate, apparently Pete Townsend invented it 20 years before then. Yeah, so yeah, he yeah, says, yeah, yeah. yeah so he yeah, says, yeah. Because yeah. I, I actually went up to Manchester for your main road gig. Did you really? Cause a, yeah, because I had a feeling that was going to... Also, because... Um, he wasn't let in. He was trying to get backstage. Please, yeah. I know him. I know no, because I felt that was going to be special. Also, because Main Road's special for me. Because I, I don't know if you went to... I went, to that, I, I, I went to it. I went in, to that gig in 1989. Gig. Yeah, I was there. Don't you worry about that, mate. No, because here's the thing, right? And I'm sorry to take over it, but, but I've been shouting about this and no one ever take, pays any attention to me. Is that I think that was a really important cultural moment. It was. Up until that moment, Pink Floyd were not cool. That's amongst true. my generation. It's true. And underneath. And I remember being at that Main Road gig. First thing was Johnny came to see me, Johnny Marr, and he turns up and he's got this floppy centre parted hair and a big pair of Timberlands. I'm thinking, what's going on here? Right. And then, and then about four songs into the show, this mat, all the stoners are down the front, and this massive gang of like casuals of guys in Pringle and Marco yeah. Polo stormed out, and it's all the all the it's obviously the acid house thing yeah. has happened, yeah. and everyone's suddenly gone Floyd, haven't yeah. they? Well, was, I can tell you now. Absolutely important. I, I can really tell you now. Thing. I was at that gig, and it was a gathering of football hooligans from the northwest, right? All on ecstasy. They were all into Pink Floyd. There was oh. no trouble. Everybody was no. giving each other the knowing grins of like, "Oh no, you're it, you're it, you're it." That was you're right. That was an amazing night. It was the first big Brilliant. big gig I'd ever been to, and I fucking blew me away. Blew me away that gig. It was amazing. But what Actually, made, but what, I'm, sort of, I'm really, really glad to hear that. But that's why I wanted to go to Main Road and see you. Right. Oh, there great. You well, thank you. But what made <laughs> what made also Nebworth so extraordinary, really, is that, and I think, you know, this is what makes Oasis so extraordinary, is that you guys had only been playing for like a few years. Yeah, that's the Three yeah. years. Well, you know, well, you well, never well, had a difficult second album like other people do. You had well, the you, biggest you're, fucking you're album probably, ever. You're, listen you're probably to, listen, just getting to your 10,000 hours well, by, by Listen Nebworth. to this. When we started uh, making the documentary that became Supersonic, it was supposed to be about Nebworth, right? But the, the guy who we got in as a producer said, look, the gig is one thing. The story leading up to Nebworth is the story you want to be telling. I was saying, why? And he said, we've looked at the facts and you only signed off the dole 18 months before walking on stage at Nebworth. Yeah. My God. I was like, what? And I went back and checked... And it's true. I think it was like not even two years from like saying to the people at the Dole office, I'm going to be on top of the pops. I'll fucking see yeah. you later. And then to, you know, to be, take part in that big, big thing was it was staggering. I mean, I've had well, lots of parties. Yeah, what's amazing in that film, though, years. is that considering you were a sort of starving young band, that you filmed so much stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm, it's amazing that you actually have that record. Yeah, we, we were surrounded by really... Of you two slagging each other off. <laughs> well, we were... Surrounded by really great people who had the wherewithal to know that it should be filmed. We didn't give a fuck. We were just we were just in it 
on the day-to-day -day thing and having one great day after another. I'm so glad it was filmed because it's coming out now and it's going to be fantastic. But let's, let's just, uh, I'm going to talk about how you kind of got into music and all, what your life was like growing up. You know, I think it's, I mean, it's obviously well doc documented, but I'd love to hear about you getting that first guitar because I know how that felt for me. I was 11. I mean, what, what happened to you? What was it? I know it was a catalogue one, wasn't it? My, mine was a, a, a black K copy of a hummingbird and my mum bought it me from a catalogue. Um, and I got into it because for some reason when I was growing up, there was my dad had an acoustic guitar, but he, he could never play it. I don't even know why he had it because my dad was a DJ and I think he had, uh, I don't know. I don't know when why he DJ, had the guitar. Obviously that's not DJ as we know it. What, what, no, he was a, he was he what, was a, an Irish. He used to DJ in the Irish social club, so he's a country and western DJ. Oh, right. And um, the, there's always this guitar behind the living room door, and I used to get grounded a lot. I was a bit of a difficult child, <clears throat> and I took this guitar up to my bedroom once and just started playing Joy Division bass lines on the top string, and that was how I got into it. And you know, everybody's story. I know I've seen. Gary, yours, when a lot of people cite that moment on top of the pops, David Bowie going doing that into the camera. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And ours was, mine would have been, mine wasn't, I didn't have like a eureka moment like you lot did seeing Bowie on top of the pops um, doing Starman. It was more of a gradual thing. But we came from Manchester, the greatest city to be a musician in the world. We had such a history and from New Order, Joy Division, well, back to the Bee Gees and the Buzzcocks. And it was kind of like the Stone Roses and Acid House coming at the same time that it was just, like, the the music that was on our doorstep was unbelievable. Unbelievable. And um, when I picked up the guitar for the first time, it just felt like that was, it felt good. It felt good. That, sorry, I just want to button it because you're left-handed, aren't you? And I play right-handed, yeah. And you play right, like me. Right, no so way. I, yeah, so I just wondered if, and. When you picked it up, it never occurred to you, uh, this isn't right. Did that, that just felt right. It was, honestly, it was only about four years later when I went in a music shop in Manchester and I was like, why have you got an, up, an upside down Stratocaster in the thing? It was like, oh, it's a left-handed one. I was like, they make left-handed guitars. And uh, I'd already persevered enough to get, you know, to get on the way. And uh, I've tried left-handed guitars down the years and it just feels so odd to me. It's just, I can't do it at all. I played on stage with Geldof and I, I, it was a, I was, we, were, we were doing a song I didn't know and I had to look at what chords he was doing. He's standing next to me. And he play, he's left-handed, but he plays he plays left-handed with a right-handed guitar with upside-down chords. It was that's just... mad. That is mad. Yeah. That's mad. I can't... I, that's just like... But the thing I think you find, what happened to me, is that you get your chords and everything. You get all that stuff together probably quicker than if you're doing it the other way around because that's actually then doing the tricky stuff. But it takes a lot longer to get a good sound. Right. I, I, I was always more of a strummer and uh, I was like you, Gary, where the, the, as soon as uh, I got the guitar in tune and I, knew, and I knew a few chords, the first thing was to write, I'm going to write a song. That was the yeah. first thing I did. I mean, after learning House of the Rising Sun, the next yeah. thing was to write a song. And um, the, the, uh, the obsession with it began as an early teenager and uh i'm st you know i say to people now doing these promo things now it's like this is this is religion for me you know this is my religion this is what i i believe in the power of music more than i believe in the power of anything else and you speak about obviously the beatles are big influence on you i mean when did that come into your life was that through your parents uh yeah it would have been through my not so much my mum and dad through my aunties my my uh, I, my my younger aunties are not that much younger than me actually and uh, they were they were all into Elvis and the Beatles. I remember actually where I was on the day that Elvis died. I was in Ireland at my grand's in County Mayo. And I remember it coming on the radio and my auntie sobbing uncontrollably well, yeah. all day. And I was like, like Who, who's this Elvis character? Who's this guy? <laughs> and I was like 10 at the time. And I'm like, Elvis. And Elvis led to the Beatles, who led to the, you know, that leads to everything else, you know what I mean? But the Beatles were, have always been there for all of us, you know what I mean? And it's kind of like, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I can remember 
ever getting into them. They were just always there. You know. Do you know what? Yeah, because I have a different, funny relationship with the Beatles. Where, where when I first started buying records, I, they'd already split up. So I was buying Wings records and George Harrison, etc., John Lennon. But the Beatles were just sort of, as you say, they they were there, and I feel like I ignored them for too long in many ways. You know. The, well, the, well, your just... your your generation. Uh, uh, at the, and rightly so at the time, dismissed everything that had gone before it, and there was a year zero with punk. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, 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 yeah, and that was like. that was punk's great strength was they built it all from the ashes of you know the m- music had gone shit, prog rock and all that. And uh, but then as all the punks got older, like Weller and Joe Strummer and yourselves and all you lot started going well, actually. <laughs> I don't mind Pink Floyd. <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I like the Beatles, you know. Uh, so, um, but yeah, but my, 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 I guess my generations, uh, we didn't really have that until Acid House came along and then rock music just took a back seat for about five years. Well, because you say, because this seems like generations away when you, you, you saw Johnny on top of the pops. Right? Yeah. And that was a big Yeah, 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 yeah. I love the Smiths. Yeah. I, love, I mean, Johnny's, yeah. Johnny's a dude. Um, yeah. But yeah, when I yeah, I mean, I was playing guitar at the time, and I wasn't, I didn't really have any ambitions to be a rock star or a pop star or anything like that. I didn't know anybody who was in a band, but I remember Johnny playing a Red Three Five Five and thinking, "Wow, that is just so fucking, that's so cool. Look at the hair and all that, you know." And uh, and um, I was with Johnny on Sunday actually up in Manchester, and uh, he's still, he's still one of my favorite human beings of all time same here, same here. he's just same here. he's one yeah. of those guys that when you when you say goodbye see you later you just feel good about yourself yeah you just feel good about everything and he, he uh, we talk at each other for about four hours about music and what we're up to and then you get in a car and go fucking hell man it's great to fuck it what dude yeah. I love and him. he always yeah. shows up exactly when he's needed i've always found that yeah that is. it just shows up when you need him yeah 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 and he yeah. you know and he's you know, he's played on lots of my stuff down the years and it's just a privilege to see him do his thing, you know, and um, the way that he weaves his guitar in and out of one of... It's great to see him do his thing on his music, but when he's doing it on yours and he's elevating one of your tunes, it's like, it's a real privilege. Oh, OK, I'm just going to hear one little boast here that one of the proudest things of my career is I got... Uh, Johnny and David Gilmour on a song together. Get out. On a record together. Yeah. Get out. No way. What was that? What was that? On the Kirsty McCall album. I can't remember. It's what uh, it might be What Do Pretty Girls Do? Or I can't remember, but the credits say. And I'm not even on it. <laughs> but you were the fixer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pino played bass on it. <clears throat> but you know, what's interesting about, about your story as well is that, you know, you sort of, in a way, I mean, I, it feels like a bit like my brother and me, you know, when we started, I was in a band and, uh, and Martin wasn't in it. And then eventually, you know, everyone persuaded me that he should be in the band. And I, and I found it quite uncomfortable. Right. And you had a similar kind of journey, but it, you know, yeah. you, you, you know, it was your brother's band. Yeah. Well, I was, I was, I, I had become uh, part of a road crew for, uh, in Spiral Carpets and, um, growing up, you know, being into music, I always thought my life would be in music. And when I got this job as a roadie, I was like, well, that, well that'll do me. I can be around. Oh, wait, I, sorry, no, but were you drum tech or were you guitar tech? I was drums and guitar. I did it I did it all at first before they got really big. And then, you know, they were, I, 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 I settled on uh, guitars and drums. Um, and I was away on tour with the Inspirals and I called home the once a week phone call and my mum said I said how's, how's Liam she said oh he's in it he's out rehearsing and I was like what doing what she's like he's in a band I was like he's in a band what's he doing she's like he's a singer I was like he was singing and now bear in mind I'd shared a bedroom with this kid all his life never been even into music and um and then they get back and I went to see them and they were kind of all right what kind of music was it? Who it was it? It was it was indie music, right? They didn't have any tunes, but they had spirit, and Liam looked good, and he had that thing. And um, he kept saying to me, "Yeah, you know, you've got tunes. Come down and jam with us." And I'd be like, "No, I can't be asked. Can't be asked." And then one Sunday afternoon, I went, and the first rehearsal I went, I was kind of doing their tunes, and of course, live music being good for the soul, it felt good, it felt really good. And then the next time I went. I said, oh, yeah, I've got some. And honestly, when 
I said to the drummer, if you play this, I said to the bass player, you play that, I'll play this, and Liam, if you sing this. Once I heard one of my own creations being played live for the first time, that's when I thought, right, this is fucking serious now. This sounds great. And it just led to a, a lifelong obsession. But the funny thing is, is I was, re- I was, I would, I kind of joined and we had a, a, we did about a week's rest and we had a gig at a local band night coming up and it was a Tuesday night at the boardwalk. And on the Monday night, it suddenly dawned on me that I'd never played guitar stood up before. <laughs> right? And I, and I didn't have a guitar strap. I never, I, ne- I never had one because why would I have one? And I was sat at home thinking, can you sit on an amp and play guitar at a gig? And I had to borrow a guitar strap off someone and practice that night standing up. And it freaked me out. It freaked me out. I was like, I couldn't, I, you know, I was so nervous. Uh, and Because uh, you had, have your guitar quite high, don't you, as well? And I, well, I, I, no, I have it. No, mine's, mine's quite low. Not as high as you did, Gary. Yeah, no, no, no. no, no yeah, yeah. Mine's no quite low, but it kind of freaked me out. I was like, I've got now, I've got to relearn all this in one night, you know. And um, but yeah, I, I, because I'd never had any really ambitions of being a, you know, what was what was to come. But I, 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 and Oasis in its early days, we had a couple of years where I'm glad we never got signed, or we never got picked up by anybody because we weren't very good. It was only going into our third year that things really started to take shape. We started to get a sound and Liam started to get more confident. And then I started to write for Liam. That's when it all started to you know, take shape. Who was shape. on the scene then? I mean, who who would have been the bands who were around you? Sort of uh, not, none, 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 because the, the, yeah. the, the, the Manchester thing had come to a grinding halt then. Stone Roses had gone, right? Stone Roses had gone. Well, they were in the, they, they'd made that first album and then disappeared. The Mondays, were always a bit shambolic and nobody knew quite what they were up to. Primal Scream, maybe? No, 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 no. I don't... No, but I mean, lo- locally, uh, no one. I mean, there's lots of local band nights and they're, they're, we were all, mu- were all much the same thing. It was just kind of... When rock music went a bit baggy, as they called it, we were all kind yeah. of doing the shuffly drum beat and trying yeah. to do something that none of us were very good at. And it wasn't until I wrote Live Forever that things changed you know it was it wasn't baggy it wasn't it wasn't it was just a clap and i i'd I'd known enough about music and read enough music magazines and had a big enough record collection to go this is a fucking great song and i don't care what anyone says and it went from that moment but you know what it's such a brilliant title for a song as well especially you know think about the way people were then the clubs you know ecstasy there's euphoria that feeling like there was a tribe that was more powerful than anything in the on the planet and and you write live forever. I mean, that's this all. But what what? But also what? I, what I wonder, I wonder about is, you know, it famously you had a lot of problems with your dad. You had a really tough upbringing. You know, you you know you might have been bashed about. You know, you don't write songs about your difficulty. You write the most positive songs you could mm-hmm. possibly write. Yeah. I don't like songwriters picking the scabs off their past. I don't like it. I don't like John Lennon's early solo material going on about his mum and all. That means nothing to me. It means a lot to him. It means nothing to me. I don't like it when songwriters tell you exactly what a song is about. Because I'm like, don't fucking do that. I'll decide what it's about. I don't want to know what yeah. it's about. I want to know what it means to me. And the one thing uh, about my songs back then and now is they were all... The lyrics were all inclusive and I got that from Acid House and I got that from being in these huge raves and the songs that did have words and vocal melodies. It was all about the collective spirit and I took that into my music and the thing that got people about Live Forever was the end kind of minute where it's like, we're going to live forever. That's ones where you see geezers crying, you know, and when, when that started happening, I was like, oh, wow. I am going to get a fucking super yacht within two. Uh, <laughs> but it's a song all of us try. I mean, it's a song Coldplay, in fairness to Coldplay, they've been trying to write now for, for all of their career. Everyone wants that to be able to give the, the audience that moment. I mean, I think even with Wonderwall, you know, like my wife said to me today, you know, um, did Noel write any love songs? I suppose, well, I suppose Wonderwall's a love song, but, but you know what? The, what's great about it is it's the audience singing it to you and you singing it to the audience we yeah. love each other in yeah, this. yeah 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 we you're did, my wonderful well you're right it's like you know what you said about nebworth is we were all there to celebrate 
ourselves you know and um i think when music gets like that you're in a real when you're when you're in the same circumstances as your audience like you're roughly the same age no one's been paid the the real big bucks yet you've yet to move to the country you're still living in the same basic circumstances that's the magic time of Absolutely. any band you know, and also, you know, when a band are the same age as the audience and, and, and mortgages aren't existing for, for anybody, kids don't exist yeah, for that, anybody. That, well, this is the thing. Kids, we love them, right? We love them all. But fucking hell, when, when you don't have them, fucking hell, it is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I Actually, can I be really... I've got a really, really picky little muso point. Oh, no, Brett, oh here um, we go. This is the no, bit that he not... turns Zoom off now. <laughs> no, it's, it's one of those things. I've always been intrigued... Why the drums come in where they do? On the All fucking bass players. It's only bass players and drummers that say that. When I, when I was doing that song, and I was like, uh, when the drums come in, back beat, the word is on the street, where the fight is, there. The drummer that we had then was adamant. He was going, no, it fucking should come in half a bar. And I was like, mate, all I can tell you is this. It's coming in there. That's the end of it. I don't know why. I'm not musically trained. That's what feels right to me. And... Um, yeah, I mean, I remember having an argument with an American singer-songwriter about one of my songs. I think it was Super Not James Sox. Taylor or someone. No, 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 no. I was no, 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 no. no. It was, I, think oh, it, I, you, I know you've brought up Amy Mann. Amy before, Mann. It was Amy Mann. Oh, there you go. And yeah. she was saying that the bridge chord going into the chorus of Supersonic, you could only have written that if you'd studied musical theory. And I was laughing, saying, musical theory? What, what even is that? And... Uh, she got really annoyed. She was like thinking I was taking the piss. She thought I'd studied musical theory and I was trying to fake it. And I was like, darling, I don't know what to tell you, man. It's just, that's where my finger went that day and that's felt right yeah. and that was it. Because Ian softly said to me that he, when he met you, who directed Backbeat. Oh yeah. The movie had inspired that, for you using that word in it. Right, <laughs> right, you know? right. He said, that, I don't know if you were just making, I don't know if he asked you a leading question, if you were just making his day. Oh, but you know, but in fairness, <laughs> in fairness, Guy, what you're saying is probably right in that everything we write yeah, every, is, is, is a collation of everything that's gone. And it is oh, of course, of course. And movie. it really, it, it used to, when we, when I, when we first came along and people say, oh yeah, but it just sounds like blah, blah, blah. And you were, and you're like, well, yeah, I wasn't expecting anybody not to fucking notice that cigarettes and alcohol sounds like T-Rex. What are you fucking mad? <laughs> uh, and I always used to say, look, he who writes the best songs tends to have the best record collection. It's like, I don't, uh, I'm not yeah. asked about being original. I couldn't give a fuck about that. I couldn't give a fuck if they say, well, your songs are just derived from the Beatles. I'd say, yes, they are. Unashamedly. If I'm in, a, when I was in the studio with Oasis and we had the, you know, um, a, a song that sounded like T-Rex, we wouldn't then try and make it sound like Kraftwerk. We'd make it sound like yeah, yeah. fucking T-Rex. You know, as, yeah. as a, as a, as a, off into the cap to Mark Bolan and it's also like this is what we are this is what we're in. we're fans of music do you know yeah. what that that sort of came more apparent like when when you guys were starting there was a sense of um admitting how eclectic you were and looking and making a bit of a scrapbook of the past there was sort of you know mm. you were curating stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. To, in order to write because yeah. one brilliant thing really unexpected which was a big part of your thing when you came out was this Burt Bacharach. Yeah. Yeah. Which was like suddenly he's like, yeah, there's all this and the bit was a rock and roll. And yeah. Burt Bacharach. Yeah. Oh, and man. Like, what? <laughs> which I, is brilliant. I, I, which is, well, you're absolutely right. You know, it's good. yeah. That guy, I mean, once I started getting into songwriting and how you do it and the funny chord change, that fucking guy, honest to God, I could listen to his songs forever. And yeah. I, he asked me to sing with him once, right? This is a true story. So I'm in, we're in LA and we're at, the, we're at Shutters on the Beach. I'm sure you've been to that hotel. Yes. And we, we'd been up all night. So we're sat out on one of the balconies and in, I can, I, I, we're looking at reception and I'm, I'm like, I'm sure that's Burt Bacharach at reception. And I was like, no, Burt Bacharach. No. He hadn't so, been up all night. Though. Right? No, no, no. So, <laughs> so he'd just come back from, so he, he owned racehorses and he'd just come back from some huge race fucking off the Kentucky Derby or something, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I go up to him. And I'm like, oh, you don't know me, mate, blah, blah. And he said, are you the guy that put my picture on the cover of the album? And I was like, yeah. So we end up chatting and he's saying, um, oh, I'm actually coming to the UK for the first time. I'm going to do a gig at the, at the Royal Festival. He's never course, played yeah. in Britain, right? And wow. he said, I'm getting all guest singers 
to sing. The, and I said, oh, who's doing This Guy's In Love With You, my favourite, one of my favourite ever songs. And he said, hey, man, why don't you do it? And I was like, yeah, 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 full of fucking lager and whatever. So anyway, <laughs> about six weeks later, one of the girls from the office calls and says, do you know Bert Bacharach? And I was like, yeah. And he said, well, he's in town and he wants you, he wants you know, see you, you're going to do this gig with him. So I ended up going to the Athenaeum Hotel deliberately two hours late thinking he won't be there so I don't have to do it, right? So at the time I wasn't a singer. And uh, as I've gone to reception, I've come to see Mr. Bacharach. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Bacharach's already left. And I'm like, fucking brilliant. He's left. I don't have to do it. I turn around. He taps me on the shoulder. He's there, right? So we end up going, <laughs> we end up, going up to his room, right? And he's got a grand piano in his room. And I'm kind of like, I'm completely out of my depth, right? I'm kind of like, what on earth am I doing here? And I start to sweat and I'm hung over. And he's just, he kind of, he disappears. And then he just, he appears at this grand piano. He's just playing. Da, 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 da. And he turned around <laughs> he turned, and he said, he said, hey man, why don't you come over and join in? And I was like, I remember I got a beer out of the fridge and I sat on the stool with him and I'm going, you see this guy? And he's going, you sound beautiful, man. And I was like, this guy was married to fucking Andy Dickinson, policewoman, my first ever crush. And he's like, yeah. and he's like, hey, you sound great, man. And I'm like, fucking hell, little did he, I sounded awful. And anyway, I ended up doing this gig at the Royal you Festival. You did it, you did it. Oh, I yeah. did the gig. And yeah. uh, it was amazing. And um, I was. Oh no! I, 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 you when, weren't, guy. And when I walked out on stage, there was a stool, and he handed me a mic, and like what well, I'm telling you, like the night before the thing, I'd never sung, I'd never played without a guitar strap. I'd never been on stage without a guitar, so he hands me a mic, <laughs> and I'm like, "What the fuck do you do now?" And I kind of half sat on this stool, and I turned into Scott Walker, you know, and I was like. <laughs> I was doing leg kicks and I was fucking getting proper no. into it. No. But it was amazing. But I, I mean, Burt Bacharach's songs, isn't the song book he's written, it's just... Uh, when you went into Oasis in those early days, you know, what was... How did that figure your relationship with Liam? Because, you know, it was his band, he was the front man, and then you come in and you deliver the songs. And you're like me. I mean, I, I recognise a lot of, of you in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in, in me. In, in, in that you like to control the situation. Yeah, I think somebody you know? has to in a band. Somebody has to. And you like, you like it to be smart and on time. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, mate, let's work backwards from what we're fucking here to do. We can all get fucking wasted. In, we have plenty of time for that. You know, I'm, 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 all, I'm always trying to make it the best that it can be, even to this day. How can we, get, how can we squeeze another 10% out of this? But I answer to the question, what did Liam think? Liam couldn't believe his fucking luck. Liam could not believe his luck. You know, if you ask a guy to join the band thinking, well, he, he can write better tunes than us, and then he plonks Live Forever down, and then the same week, slide away. Okay, you know, we've both looked out here. But um, our relationship didn't really get strained until round about the time after Nebworth. You know what I mean? Once When we got paid and everybody started to drift apart and it starts to become a different thing, then once, you, once the camaraderie and the being in the back of the van and all flying together and all that kind of thing. Once you drift apart and you get your missus and the kids and all that, then it becomes something else. And you know, we, we, I mean, we kept it going for a good 11 years after that. Yeah. And then you just drift apart, you know, it's natural. But I, I suppose, you know, there's two ways of doing it. Either you say, you know, we, because with my me and my brother, you know, he, he was we we shared a bedroom. He had footballers on his wall. I had guitars on my wall. I had the record player by my right. beside of my bed. You know, I was kind of arty. He was definitely more sporty. Right. But we sort of saw it as being like, you do this, I do that, and together we're stronger. But but there's always that ele element of like, I just wish I was you. Mm. Sometimes. Yeah. You know, oh yeah. I, wish I could be. Like, Still to the, you know, I, you know, going solo, it's like, I'm a terrible salesman. I'm the worst. And front men, what they are, are salesmen. They can fucking sell anything. And they can make average songs sound great. And they can carry a night in an arena like no one else. I can't do that now. So my songs now have to be twice as good as what they used to be. Uh, and they've got, because I can't, I can't do that thing that Liam was the best in the world at talking utter fucking nonsense down a mic about furry skateboards and a fucking corduroy poodle. And you'd think, fucking, what is he fucking going on? But people loved it. So I was like, and, uh, <laughs> but it was, you know, 
There was the, the thing when it's I I could never accept walking off stage in the middle of a gig. I would never accept that. I would never accept not turning up and the gig being cancelled. That's when I started to take singing seriously because I was like, well, I'm fucking damned if I've come all the fucking way here mm -hmm. and I'm not having a night out because you're on over. Fuck that. So every album we made, I started to sing more songs and more songs so that, you know, there's nothing worse than being... I remember him walking off stage once in a gig in Italy. There were 76,000 people there and he just popped his in-ear monitors off and fucking went home. No, no explanation. And it was like, fuck you, man. Do you know what I mean? It's like, fuck... Don't do that to fans and don't do that to your mates in the band. And that, that you know... That costs money as well, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, well, no, because I, I sold it on and did the gig, right? right. And I felt, I felt sorry for the fans. That's like, I'm not giving anybody yeah. the satisfaction but, of pulling this fucking but, gig. But you got angry as well at some point, didn't you, in America yeah, yeah, yeah. on the early tour and you, 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 you left the tour as well, yeah, yeah. you know? Well, I... I, I uh, look, we were, all, we were all burning the candle at both ends, let's put it that way. But... You got to do the shows, and there was a bit of. I felt there was a bit of. Oh, we made it now, and we fucking rock and roll, mate. We've made it. There's no need to put the work in anymore. Not that no one ever said those words, but I felt that was an attitude. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I don't fucking if I'm if we're not going to take it seriously, I'd rather not do it. You know, I'd rather not do it. And um, mm. I, I I overreacted in some situations, obviously, and a lot of drugs was a lot to do with that. But the more <laughs> the more chaos surrounded the band, the bigger it got. You know, yeah. it's mad. It's like my fucking football team, City. The further down the fucking leagues we went, the more people turned up to see it. It was mad. <laughs> yeah, because because in a way that that's you were just normal blokes. Yeah, yeah. That you would probably be acting exactly like this if you weren't in a band. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We know? were. I mean, yeah. So we, that, I think that was it. That was attractive to a lot of people because they they you know you weren't you know that I think in the eighties maybe we played a game of being. You know, we weren't like you, but that's okay because Bowie wasn't like us. So we wanted people to be different and elevated and going places we yeah, could dream of. But there became a, it was the opposite of that. But there's no shame in there's two there's two ways of looking at rock stardom, right? There's no shame in your generation looking at an audience and saying, "I want them to think they could never do this. This is fucking special thing." There's no shame in that. That's what rock stardom is. The other school thought. It's like the 90s thing where it's like, if we can do it, you can do it. That was our attitude. But they're both valid points. You know what I mean? Because people, that uh, section of people, they don't want to go to an arena and pay 75 quid to see a guy just like them. They want to fucking see a guy in a cape, right? Fucking talking nonsense down the mic to be the person they could never be, right? But then there's the other school of thought where it's like you can inspire people in an audience to be like you. Do you know what I mean? So it's all yeah. part of the same thing for me. Also, that thing of when you disappeared on that tour, I guess that's another thing about the internet mobile age. You probably you couldn't do that. No, 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 not at all. No, <laughs> no, no. Somebody would fucking tweet about it. But um, yeah, they were they were they were they were crazy fucking days. And, you know, we were all young and all fueled by fucking drugs and booze. And, uh, you know, but the, but like like Gary was saying, you know, I had to keep it together to, in some respect. You know what I mean? It's like somebody's... While they were all... While, you know, we would all be out parties, blah, 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 and all the rest of it. Someone's got to write the songs. But all the people who have been through the band, I mean, are you still... Has, has that sort of tended to end well or badly? Bonehead. In touch with I've, got, I've, I've got three members of Oasis in my band. You know, yeah. we're... Yeah, we're oh, Andy yeah. Bell, right? Uh, yeah. No, Andy's, I mean, Andy went off done his own thing. I've got Gems in my band and yeah, Chris Sharrock, who was the last drummer. Uh, Mike, my keyboard player, played for Oasis for years but um Mikey no, Rowe Mike Rowe my, my name oh yeah you know yeah of course yeah. 30 yards away yeah oh, that's right um he uh, yeah he's played with me for a long long time but um no I still see Bonehead if I go to Manchester I mean I don't I don't go out of my way to see him but I have seen him and all the relationships with everybody in the band is fine apart from the one with Liam unfortunately but you know that's... do you know what though it, you know I, you you feel for certain guys though because you you have this heightened reality it's this ridiculous heightened reality so early in your life it's very difficult to know what you're going to do for the rest of it it's a bit like those guys I, you hear about the soldiers who came back from World War 2 that are you know fought yeah. on the beaches when they came back they just sat at home being silent because nothing could compete with that yeah, yeah, you, you yeah. know adrenaline that yeah. they had but you know you've got to be smart enough when you're in it to realise what the fuck is going on here you know what I mean and you've got to be in it 
for the long run. And uh, you know, we all we all every member of a band will perceive their role in it completely differently. I always felt I would be sat here today, even when I was at Nebworth. I always just felt it. I would never give up. I would ne the band if the band imploded the next night. I would always carry on writing songs no matter what. I didn't. I, mm. I never had any ambitions to be a, a singer at that time, but I would never, never, ever give up writing songs ever for anything. Not for anything. And I don't even give a shit if they're successful or not. It's kind of my meditation. I'm not into spirituality and religion and fucking therapy and all that bollocks. Sitting down with that guitar, with the TV on, with the sound down on a quiet night when the house is empty is it for me. That mm -hmm. I get rid of all my shit, angst, yeah. pain, everything is strummed out on that guitar. And if you're lucky, you get a song at the end of it. I'm not writing about it, but something will come. And that I will never give that up ever. No. And that's a and that's a great feeling because you get up the next day and you you think, wow, last night I made this. Yeah, yeah, totally. Play. And I bet Bert Bacharach is still going to the piano. Absolutely. Well, why wouldn't you? And I and you know people say to me, um, oh, you know, you don't think about retiring. I'm like. Mate, as long as you can, right, you should. Because there's enough shit in the world, right, that people have to deal with on the news that why would you retire if you can still do it? I can't, that, that, I cannot get my head around that attitude. And um, even more so, now we've been kind of at home for a year and a half, it's, it's made me more. Yeah. It's not made me less of anything. It's made me more determined to write more songs and to get, you know, to, to keep it going. You know what I mean? No, I, I know we, we probably outstayed our welcome here. We had you That's for an hour and we've had you for yeah. an hour and 10. And we'll say thank you, mate. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. That's I've listened really... to a few of them and they've been really fucking good, man. It's a great sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. And what's funny is everybody, everybody's tale is all slightly different. Everybody's got a different story about, yeah. although we all do the same thing and to the, to the casual observer, you know, you you all play instruments and you all do that. It's like all the nuances are really inspiring when you hear different peoples yeah. of how they did it. And I don't have you read that book, The Isle Isle of Noises? No. Oh, so it's not it's not I Love Noises. It's I S L E. And this guy has interviewed. Oh, like this guy has interviewed like fifty great British songwriters: Jimmy Page, Ray Davis, Joan Armatrade, in Annie Lennox. I'm in it. Well, is in it. And it's just all about specifically songwriting, how they do it. And it's amazing that everybody's tale is completely different. And it makes you realize that actually there is no rules to this at all. And it's all about personal expression. For rightly or wrongly, it's you're expressing something from in you. You put it out there and it connects with like-minded people. And it's like it's a, it's a spiritual thing, man. Listen, give Weller a nudge. I've been trying to get him on the show. I've texted him a few yeah. times, and he's a bit he's he's a bit nervous about it. I'll probably, he, he, he literally lives thirty seconds from me, so I'll probably see him at the Tesco's later, and I'll say, "Oh man, <laughs> yeah, he's well, he 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 is a he's fucking far out that guy. He's oh, yeah. he's written and recorded and released two albums in lockdown. I love him. I love him. And I yeah. I was yeah. saying to a journalist the other day, I said. You know, from now on, all pandemics should be measured in Paul Weller albums. You know, we're up to <laughs> we're up to yeah. we're up to two in this one, and uh, he shows no signs of stopping. But yeah, him and Taylor Swift, him and Taylor Swift yeah. put two albums out <laughs> in the pandemic. I know, I know, I know. Fucking hell! Now that's I mean, what he does. There's a combination. Yeah, listen, mate. Listen, good luck with the film. Thank you very much. Oh, and I have to yes. say, I watched your Saucer yeah. Full of Secrets thing in lockdown as well. I told I told you that, Gary, and it was fucking great, yeah. man. Really good. Oh, great. And, uh, Thank you. Thank Nick. You. I met Nick a few times. He's such a fucking dude. He's got the dry sense yeah. of humour, and uh, the sound of it was amazing. And uh, I have to get, I have to get that keyboard player to play on some of my stuff. He's really great, isn't he? Oh, Dom, oh, Dom Beacon. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll yeah, set yeah. you up. We'll yeah. set you up. Let he, me. Know. I'll send you a text. He's brilliant. Nice one, guys. All right, mate. Brilliant. All the best. Cheers, man. Bye. Cheers, Bye. That was a brilliant, brilliant, inspirational chat. I, I yeah. love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's a, a pretty thoughtful guy about the whole culture of pop music and what it means. And, he, you know, he's got his chops as far as the history of pop music is concerned. You know, I, that was a pleasure. That's everything we want uh, really on was Rock on Tours. And also actually quite a big deal to finally have my Pink Floyd at Main Road story validated. 
<laughs> Let's thank you for listening to another episode of Rock on Tours. We're going to be here next week, but uh, leave reviews. And you're so nice to us on social media. Everything you say on our Instagram site and Twitter site has been, uh, we read it all and we, we appreciate it. Yes, we do. So, uh, and thanks to Ben, our producer. And so it's good night from me. And it's good night from these guitars behind me. Ha, ha, ha.